motorcycle fans, you found the right video. That is the world's quickest and fastest Honda. It's been over 200 miles an hour, deep in the sixes, and yes, you see that? It's a street bike. You gotta see this. get started with this video but before we do could you please hit subscribe or like so you never miss an update from us we've got a lot of great stuff coming out Oh, cycle drag motorcycle fans, am I pumped up? Am I excited for this video? We are here, Schaumburg, Illinois, right outside of Chicago, and this is the house of the pro street motorcycle legend, Kent Stotts, a four-time champion, one of the men who created the category. His son, Frankie, oh yeah, number four on the GOAT list. He's been 646. He has the world's quickest and fastest Honda. We're going to see it. We might even hear it run. Let's see if, uh, let's see if the crew is around. Gotta love it. Kent Stotts. Hello, Jack. Mr. Kent. What's Good happening? to see you, man. You you never you never know when cycle drag's gonna show up here. Okay. So I, I hope it's not too late. I'm hoping we can get a look at that record setting Honda. Come on in. Let's do it. I think if I fire it now, it's gonna stink it. Oh my guys, you gotta see this. We are here in the garage of the Honda Legend. Share this with any Honda fan. They're gonna wanna see it. Oh, am I excited for this? There it is, ladies and gentlemen, the world's quickest CBR 1000. There is the fearless pilot, Mr. Frankie. Great to see you, number four on the GOAT list. Guys, I'm so happy to be here. I've wanted to catch up with you guys in your shop for so long. How are things going for you, first off? Well, the COVID year has been a rough year for us. You know, last year, we 2018, he won the championship uh, in NHDRO, and then 2019, we went after the XDA title, uh, was number two for a long time, and right at the end, dropped to number three. But it was a great time, uh, just fantastic competition and great people. Anybody who knows motorcycle drag racing knows you guys for sure. You have a long and storied history. But for people, more casual fans that are watching right now, let's, let's show them what they're looking at right there. This is the world's quickest and fastest Honda street bike it's amazing. It's been 646, 217. Give me a little tour of the motorcycle. Um, it's, I mean, you got your plenum, you got everything any other bike does, but uh, this year they've allowed the fuel cell to be moved up front. So we can have, move some weight up there. We cleaned up everything. We mounted the coils up front, try and move as much weight as far, as far forward as possible. Um, we were allowed to drop the seat height to 20 inches. Well, it's been 20 inches for a long time, but when this bike was originally built, it was 22. So this is the first year we, we actually had it down to 20. And unfortunately with the COVID thing, when it hit, we had to financially, I, I couldn't afford to, to run the XDA circuit. And then the whole season kind of went to hell for us. Frankie, let's talk about one of the elephants in the room right away because I, I, w I had the pleasure of being in Brad Mummert's garage. I had the pleasure of talking to Jordan Haas and I say the world's quickest street bikes and always somebody in the comments say, hey, that's not a street bike. Even though we clearly show the street tire, which in drag racing uh, signifies street, but there are, of course, with most pro street bikes, there's some things like cooling system removal. However, however, you got to clear the air right now that you do ride this on the street. Tell me about that. Uh, I do ride this thing to the street. Uh, it does have a short radius that I can leave from the garage, <laughs> uh, but it does make it to uh, a local restaurant right down the street and a local bike night. So what is the reaction when you roll into a local bike night with this, a six second street bike, mid six seconds? I don't think most people really know what it is. Um, you know, they just see a bike that they usually don't see uh, very often so it's like kind of like a wow factor but to know that it's as quick as it is i don't think people actually really know they know something's up because it does run on methanol 
And that's got a very distinct and, and right, distinct uh, smell. smell that actually hurts the eyes if you get too close. And they look at it again, what the heck is this thing? But methanol is one of the reasons why you can run it on the street without a radiator. It'll, it'll go for three to five miles without overheating uh, and you can make it back. Well, I can vouch for that because I'm the crazy guy usually sticking the cell phone two inches from you guys on the line. So <laughs> I know this fuel. I love this fuel. That's for sure. Uh, it really is a, a truly amazing motorcycle. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the father-son combination here. Kent, you've been involved in motorcycle drag racing how many years now? Well, I mean, all my life, but uh, starting with the first time that there was an organized race for street bikes was 1995 with ProStar. And you were in the sport even before that, right? Oh, long before that with Funny Bikes, uh, TJ Hoffmeister, the Mr. Turbo team. Uh, I've known them all, the Orient Express team. Uh, and that was the thing. And, and basically, most of our bikes came from a lot of used up Funny Bike parts that we put in our street bikes. Truly amazing. So you were there in the beginning, the genesis of yes. Street Bike Shootout. 1995. Let's do a quick flashback. I know, Frank. Frankie, were you alive yet? 95? Yeah, probably? I was 10. 10 years old. Okay, 10 years, 10 years old. old. You look very young. <laughs> um, 1995. Right. What was a fast pro street, street bike shootout bike back then? Well, nobody knew for sure what it was. We all came in there knowing what kind of times we could run, but we weren't showing on the clocks. So nobody knew what the other guy could run. The Tommy Maselli's, the Billy Bose, you know, me I'm in the Midwest. Uh, we all knew we were fast, but nobody knew who the fastest was. So basically the first rules were 68 inches. You have to run a road course and it has to be a street tire. Everything else was run what you brung. And they were all truly street bikes. Are you just blown away at how far this sport has come? I, somebody asked me, when we set the first national record in 95 at an 834, which at the time I was number one with an 834, Tommy Maselli was number two with an 860, and the next guy was an 890. So then they started to see who's, who's the heavy hitters and who's not, and then a turbo bike could get off the line, which was nobody thought it could back then. Truly amazing. Well, we have a special treat for everybody because, Frankie, we've got your fastest, your quickest pass, not your fastest, your quickest pass, a 646 well, on tape. It's also his fastest. It's also his fastest. Okay, 217 was the quickest and fastest this bike's ever been. Excellent. So I was right. Guys, let's take you back to Maryland International Raceway, June 2019. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. How about that, Crow? He picks up another one. Congratulations. How about that? So guys, that's a that's a run, that's a weekend I'll never forget. 
I mean, first off, we got to talk about the big news. You go a career best, 646 and lose. Well, he, not only a career best, the record coming into the event was 660. No, so, no, 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 or no. 650. No, it was a 646. Six coming in. Coming into the race, because we went, at, we went at 58 on M5, blew the motor up. What race was that? That was the race we went to 650s at. That was when Teasley went to 46 at the round after we went to 58. Okay, well, to start the season, this race season started off at a 660 was the record, and we held yeah, that. Yeah, it was in Valdosta. We have that round as well. That was four of them in a row. That was when we could have entered Frankie and Pro ET in yeah. 660s. Yeah, so we figured we're pretty good. And we knew we could get 650s out of it. And by the second race, here it was. We go to the final. We go at 646 and lose a tenth and a half under the record. And we lose to Teasley and DME team. And God bless them. They went at 642 and, and made it look easy. Frankie, what do you remember about that run? I know I talked to you before. and You, you knew you were going to go fast. You said, we're going to go fast here to go a career best and not get the W. Tell me about what you remember. Uh, I mean, it was definitely heartbreaking, uh, but I mean, it was a good weekend. I mean, we went, I think our best before that weekend was a 50, like a low, Eight. like a 58, let's say, say, and then we dropped it all the way down to a 46 and we dropped it within a 10th with doing four passes pretty much. So, uh, I mean, it was, I mean, it wasn't fun to lose, um, but it was, it was a fun weekend and we learned a lot and then, uh, we capitalized on capitalize on it after that and guys stay with us all throughout this video because at the end we're going to hear this beastly honda run you do not want to leave we're going to fire it up sorry i'm putting i'm putting you guys on the spot let's hope it, i know this is you know drag bike you never know what can happen we got to make sure there's proper fuel in it and everything but i think you guys are, are ready to go frankie i got another question for you okay 217 on a street tire with no willy bar there's people watching this that think they got fast street bikes. How could you explain that? And I also want to say that for those guys that have been fast on the salt flats or Mexico, shall we say, mm -hmm. not in the United States, um, 217 and a quarter mile, 1,320 feet from a dead stop. How would you describe that? <laughs> Hard to describe, uh, huge adrenaline, adrenaline rush, obviously, but I mean, most people that are doing the soft flats, you know, they have miles to get up to that speed where we just, like you said, we only have 1,320 feet. So it's feeling those G forces is uh, pretty intense. I've seen pictures of you online with not one tire off the ground, <laughs> both tires off the ground, and I'm talking 1,000 feet down the racetrack. I mean... That was my fault. <laughs> well, that, that's because, you know, Dad's famous saying is that, you know, he's not riding the bike, so it's not like he has to work I can on. throw the kitchen sink at it. Frank's riding it, not me. <laughs> that's pretty much how it goes. If I hurt him, though, his mom's going to kill me. Yeah, well, hey, you know, that shows how quickly you gained confidence and trust. I know there was a day following your career when you were a little worried about turning Frank loose, and then you said after just a test session or two, you're like, this kid has it. Real quick story. We went to the track. He had never been on anything but a stock 1,000. He'd gone a 10.03 on a bone stock 1,000. We couldn't find him a ride on a 950 or a, even an 850 bike anywhere, so... Uh, I wanted him to ride this bike the next year, so we went to the track. His first pass, he he threw the he went throttle first and clutch second and blew the tire away. But the next pass, he went right down the track. I turned the boost up, so he went a 920. Then he went an 880. Then he went an 840. Then he went a 780. Boom, boom, boom. From a 1003 to a 780 and four passes. It it was amazing. So Frankie, clearly you were paying close attention all those years when your dad was bringing you to the track because you took to it pretty quickly. Yeah, who knew that I was actually paying attention? <laughs> so, not his strong suit. Yeah, definitely not my strong suit. But uh, it definitely paid off because uh, there wasn't much that my dad really had to really instruct me on. Obviously, there were certain things that he wanted me to follow, like certain rules, um, as, you know, as far as like riding, finding a target, down track, and keeping a hold on that. Um, I, I've been more studious my whole life. I want to learn what makes it go faster than I want to learn what made me a better rider. He has just a lot of natural raw talent that he feels stuff in the bike. He'll come back from a run and he'll say, Dad, it did this. And I'll look at the data 
and it, it I couldn't see it in the data, but then if you if you cross reference three or four pieces of data, it's exactly what the bike did is what he's feeling in his ass and can can relate that to me better than any data. Well, Frankie, you got a heck of a natural talent there because, you know, that's what they say makes great NASCAR drivers. Not only the ability to drive, but the ability to communicate with the crew chief and tell them what the car needs, what's going on. Right. So that's that's very, very important there. There's a there's a, a, a real quick story. I don't know if this will make it, but that was the difference when Terry Vance used to dominate everybody. All of a sudden, Dave Schultz was able to, to keep up with him. Not, not beat him all the time, but about the only one that could. And the difference was in the data. Terry Vance was like a, a, a human computer. He could come back and tell Byron Hines exactly what the bike did, and then he would make it better from there. With, before there was data. Dave Schultz started putting data on the bike, and now he could do the same thing that Terry could because he had data. Amazing. And you gave us a perfect segue right into a topic I wanted to cover. Technology, data, electronics. I told you I was speaking with some detractors out there who want the human element in drag racing. And it happens in radial car racing where there's guys saying, hey, we're going to have remote controls and monkeys in the cars before you know it because there's so many electronics. Well, then I talked to a guy like Rudy Sanzatera who brings up a good point. He said, we've already cracked Pandora's box open. Just kick it the whole way open. We got a lot of stuff going on here. Wheelie control, traction control, technology's off the charts. Tell me about some of the technology right now you guys are using that's really taking this to the next level. Well, it's, it's been out there for a little bit. It's just uh, lately, um, it's, it's been legal for two years. Traction control's been legal for two or three years. Uh, ride height control just got, got released last year. Uh, so now, boy, we're just at the beginning of what we can do with this stuff. And have you seen what the drag radio cars did with it three or four years ago? They didn't have any limits on it. And now you see a drag radio car go down the track doesn't look like he's doing anything exciting, but he's blowing out 350s at a crazy mile an hour in the eighth mile. We're, these these bikes are just going to get faster the more we learn. Truly is staggering. What's, what's your view on technology? Because you're such a talented rider. Do you want to keep a certain amount of technology out? Or are you saying, let's go for it all out? I, mean, I don't know. I just think the more technology, the more or less, I guess, responsibilities the rider has. I mean, with wheelie control, that's one less thing that we have to worry about. I mean, so now you pretty much just hold it wide open and the bike just does whatever the person controlling the laptop tells it to. The Richard Gadsons, the Jeremy Teasleys, and Frankie, these are natural riders that have a gift that you, you can't teach. Uh, and But with electronic controls, you can calm a bike down enough that an average rider can be very competitive. So that's good for the field. But it's, it's a little sad for somebody that's got a great clutch hand or a great feel for, for when, you know, they can just hover that front wheel an inch off the ground with their abilities and not the bike's computer. And I think a, a, a lot of the good thing about our class is like the wow factor. And you take out the, you take wheelie control or you put wheel control on the bikes and you have less bikes doing crazier wheelies. And obviously they're going to still do wheelies, but they're just not going to be as wild. They're going to be more controlled. One of the biggest hits on videos that we had was when <laughs> I messed up on the boost controller and at a thousand feet, the bike jumped off the ground, all front wheel and rear wheel. And uh, he went for a hell of a ride. And that makes for great viewership. It doesn't, he managed to save the pass and win the round, but you, you're going to see less and less of that because of the computer controls. And that's one thing I, I don't want to go away. And that's why I feel... So you want me to throw your, your ass up in the air at a thousand feet? <laughs> you probably don't want to do that again, right? miles an hour and send you into the air. I just want to put on a show, and I think that wheelie control and all that is just it's taking the fun out of it. All right, well, speaking... You guys are giving me another great segue, because speaking of putting on a show, you know, I, I love fast motorcycles, and, you know, it almost sounded like hyperbole many years ago, but you, you guys really are approaching top fuel. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Back of the pack, top fuel guys, Nitro Harley guys are running, you know, 6.0s, 16s. You guys, you guys are knocking on the door of 6.20s. I don't understand how these bikes can go so much faster without a wheelie bar, without a slick. We used to believe back in the day, Kent, you know, that funny bike, you needed a wheelie bar and a slick. Yep. And this class was much slower, street bike shootout. Now is the 
is the lack of the parasitic drag of a slick or the lack of a willy bar. Is it proving to be actually a better combination? A yes radial and tire? No. Smoother is always faster. Smooth is fast. The more you can apply power in a smooth fashion, you can apply more and more power. When you, when you apply it abruptly, or like the case with a slick, a slick will spin and hook and then cause the chassis to get upset and cause a wheelie. These bikes have to remain hooked up and they'll make perfect passes. If they spin, if they start to spin, they'll let loose and your pass is pretty much gone. But uh, that's, that's smoother is faster and that's what we've been developing since the first race in 95 when we went in 834. We learned how to apply power sooner and smoother. Heard some people worry about getting close to our limits. This is a good question for you, Frankie. Are, are we approaching any safety limits for a DOT tire? We're talking 217, uh, 646. Teasley's got the record at a 634, right? And Litton's been 232. Correct. It's on street tire, DOT legal. Are we approaching any safety limits there, you think? I don't believe so. The Dunlop has, thankfully, Dunlop came along. And, you know, for years we were limited uh, when the Yokohama got got out or stopped being produced, uh, then we had a, a Shinko, and that came to the edge, edge of its performance limits, and then everybody had to buy a, a $800 Michelin Power One. Well, Dunlop has come to the rescue, designed a tire for exactly what we do. It's still DOT approved, and uh, I don't I don't see any any safety issues. At this point. All right. So how about this question? What's left? Where do we go from here? Teasley just put a, a 30, mid 30 on the board. Where do we go? Are we knocking on the door 20s? And, you know, I'm, I'm very old, old school. And years ago, when we held the record at 811, somebody said, well, where do you think this will end? I said, well, we'll definitely go into sevens, but probably 775 is about the best we're ever going to get out of a street bike. And it, it I'm the one doing the work. He's doing the riding, and it still never ceases to amaze me. We, we, you just don't stop working until you go faster. Well, speaking of that, Ken, I got to ask you. You held the record when you stepped off 2006, 725. That was absolutely smoking back then. Do you want any parts of this machine right now that you're looking at? Is there any temptation to twist the throttle, or are you like, this is way too fast? No, no, that, the speed never... It, speed was never an issue with me. I loved the the G force. I loved when it's throwing me back in the seat, and and it's trying to throw me off the bike. That that's so much fun to control that kind of power. So I would like to get on it again. I just uh, I got fat in my old age, and I'm I'm gonna be working on that this winter. Well, there's there's nothing wrong with that, and I'm I'm sure you still got it. That's for sure. Um, what's what's next for this program, Frankie? I know that uh, you've already won a championship in NHDRO. You were third in XDA points. You've had a great showing out there. Only downfalls. It's a very far drive to Maryland here from Chicago. But Huge. Uh, what's next? What are you guys shooting for? Uh, well, we're going to see what this year brings. At the end of the year, we've got our proposal back into Honda. We've been with Honda since '99, so going on 21 years. Uh, we really. We're trying to get a hold of a, a body for the, the new 2021 1000RR and adapt it to this bike so we can get it looking modern and uh, looking sharp. Well, that's another thing I want to talk to you about because you've done a great job. And, you know, there's so many people that follow cycle drag. They're just all around motorcycle people and don't necessarily come to the drag bike races. Another question I get is, hey, why is it all Kawasaki's and Suzuki's? Where's the Hondas? Where these, where's the Yamahas? I don't really have many answers for Yamaha, but when people ask Honda, I say, you got to look at, at Frankie Stotts. He's, he's killing it. But why, why don't we see more Hondas, you think? Honda, Honda has, they judge a, a bike, its abilities primarily by road racing. Because just going fast in a straight line is not the total bike. So obviously on the showroom floor, it's a fantastic bike, but it's an easier to road race bike than most because it delivers power smoothly. It lacks a little bit in raw horsepower uh, to the Suzuki and the Kawasaki, which is what drag racers want. 
Well, now the 2021 Honda 1000 RRR is the bad boy of them all. And it's got more horsepower on the showroom floor than anything. So uh, we're, we're hoping we can get one of those from Honda and start working on that. Well, you guys are proving that you can have Hondas out there. And I think you are pretty well good poster men for Honda. Frankie, what would that mean to you if you could, if Honda would say, hey, all right, we want to market this bike for drag racing. You're our guy. Uh, I just think it'd be a good opportunity for all of us. Um, having a new bike, obviously, in Pro Street and R&D and that. And then having one in uh, possibly the super stock class would be, uh, I think, something right up uh, Honda's alley. Yeah, the Honda, the, the Superstock class would be really great because at least we're starting with an equal or more horsepower than everybody else. Then again, you have to control it, which I'm pretty good with a computer, but they're not allowing you to do much in that class. But he's got the the feel to control it. So I, I hope we get a chance to do that. And Ken, if you could shed a little light, I, I know there's probably a lot of people with their ears wide open right now because everybody wants a sponsor. You have been able to get a manufacturer as a sponsor and keep a manufacturer as a sponsor. How did you foster that relationship with Honda? Uh, actually, here's a story. I beat Ricky Gadsden, the factory rider, at a race here in Chicago in, in 1999, 98. Good old Pro Star days, right? Pro, pro Star days. And the head of Kawasaki, John Hoover, said, I want to have a meeting with you. And I thought, great, we're going to have a two-bike Kawasaki team. I'm going to be teammates with Ricky Gadsden. And the first thing he said to me was, I want you to ride for Honda. <laughs> Honda hasn't drag raced since 1980s. So what was happening at that time was all the manufacturers were getting into drag racing. It was very popular. Um, it, it's, it no longer had the stigma of thugs. Um, so Honda wanted to get back into it, and they got back in in a smaller, they didn't want the, the big rig that Kawasaki had. They wanted a small team like mine that uh, could show what their bike can do. And, it, it, well, it's amazing. I, how have, here's the million-dollar question. How have you been able to make that relationship stick since 99? Honda's a great company. They're fantastic to work with and for. Um, they're very patient. You know, I had a lot of lean years. Um, but still four championships, well, now five with his. So, I and mean, then that's, that's over a 20 year career. That's not, that's actually pretty good in overall averages. Uh, Suzuki's had more just because that's the predominant bike in the class. But we're showing it can be done with the Honda very, no, not easily, but nothing's easy. Well, I'm proud of you because that shows that there's something special about your team as well because. Honda is a great manufacturer, but the truth is most sponsored riders have been cut, especially during the recession and motorcycle sales down. You guys have been able to hold on. I know one funny story I remember about you. This was way back after a pro star race. I barely got a voice. We're all tired. First flight out, I see you in a suit. You say, I'm, where are you going in a suit? Going to Honda. So, I mean, those are the kind of things that you did that, that vaulted you ahead. You were, you were in the boardroom, right? Yes. A lot of people don't understand and most drag racers do this for fun if they realize the amount of work it takes to get a sponsor and then keep them happy. Uh, they just not only, they, they just don't do it. Uh, it's a lot of work. For every hour I put in on this bike, I put another hour in promotions and uh, helping my sponsors push their products and, and make it better. But most people just want to work on their bikes. Well, you're great at that, and you're great at branding, and there definitely is two components. There's two sides to it. And, you know, Del Flores, he wised me up before my first PRI show. He said, look, okay, don't don't show up in a exhaust pipe T-shirt and ripped jeans. It's not it's not going to work. These are serious businessmen, and yeah. you have to have serious proposals and pitches. And a lot of guys, they get insulted, drag racers, because they work so hard on their bikes, and they smash records, right? right? And then they show up at PRI, and they say, well, look at what I've done. But – the truth is we're, we're needle in the haystack motorsport compared to what's out there. So you really, you got to have the marketing side covered. And that's something that you seem to always have a knack at. And where did you, where did you develop such a great knack at this? Um, well, again, it goes back to the Mr. Turbo days. I got a really good schooling. Uh, when I put, got married, I sold all my bikes and spent three years with the Mr. Turbo funny bike team, TJ Hoffmeister. And I was going out to dinner at that time. Nobody stayed in hotels or nobody stayed in motor homes. We were all in hotels, usually the same one. We'd go out to dinner and I'm sitting with Terry Vance, Byron Hines, Mike Murdoch of MRE, oh uh, Jack O'Malley of Orient Express, uh, 
uh, Ted Hoffmeister of Mr. Turbo, Bill Hahn Sr. I'm sitting with the masterminds of drag racing, and I was, it was like E.F. Hutton was talking. I was a sponge for three years, and I had a fantastic learning curve. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you had the Midas touch. I did. From well, some of the best. And I believe we were talking moments ago before we started this about uh, Dave Schultz he even gave you some advice. And there was one of the best ever, right? Dave, well, the big thing there, all those other people that I just mentioned are in the performance and part of it. Dave Schultz came, came to me early on and said, Kent, people want to see your street bike. That's why these magazines are putting you in their, in their magazine. You need to learn how to, to, to promote this sport and your sponsors because you're, you're doing it just like a backyard racer and you, you need a little guidance. And thank God he was there. Fantastic guy. And I, I listened to him and he tutored me for almost four years. I love it. Very, very cool. Well, I want to give everybody a little trip back down memory lane real quick. We got something special up here on the wall. We were talking about the motorcycle that you had that... Uh, Early on, I mean, this is one that I remember. This has got to be mid-90s, right? What's, right. The, what's the story here, Kent? That's the 1995 water-cooled Suzuki. Uh, I've generally gone down the path that most people don't. Uh, everybody said a uh, water-cooled couldn't handle the power. Uh, we proved them wrong, won the championship in 98 with, with that bike. That's amazing. And the best ET there was? 811. 811. And look at how far... We have come. And Frankie, for those watching, we want to let them live vicariously through our video here and feel a little speed. Just if you could walk me through your routine from the time you pull into the burnout box, what are you doing over here? Uh, pretty much when I pull into the burnout box, obviously I have my tether kill on. Uh, stick the bike in the second gear. Look at the old man. Dad tells me to go ahead and start the burnout. Do the burnout. He tells me to lean it to the left. Then he tells me to lean it to the right. And standing straight up in the middle, and then he pulls me out of the burnout. When I'm pulling out to him, I'm also looking where his foot is, which is pretty much where I line up myself. Uh, also looking down the track, also finding my target. And then uh, once I pull up to him, I stick the bike in neutral. Uh, then I also stick it in first gear, uh, turn around, turn the uh, air bottle on, and then which is obviously not here anymore because it's in the air, t it's in the swing arm now, so I don't have to do that anymore. So that's one step I don't have to do. Um, but then once I turn the bottle on or turn the um, air system on, then uh, it's pretty much look behind me, make sure I'm straight. The old man gives me a thumbs up and then uh, go about my way. Gone. And I mean, that acceleration just... What's that like? Uh, like the old man said, it's just pretty much like throwing you in the back of the seat. It's a good thing this is metal because otherwise I'd probably be right out the back of it. So I can tell, you're, you said you're what, 27 hours from Maryland, right? Yeah, yeah round trip, 27 hours. You're yeah. talking about you got to get up at 4 a.m. tomorrow. You're a hardworking guy. It's a lot of sacrifice to do this. When you feel that sensation, does that just put that smile on your face? Like, yep, this is, this is why I do this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good reward for a lot of hard work. I mean, obviously, Dad puts in a lot more work than I do, but uh, the gratification for winning is just as good as for both of us. That's amazing. What an awesome program here, Kent. It well, really is cool. You know, he didn't quite understand. He knew how hard I worked at it, but he needed to step his program up, too. And, and in 2017, it was the fourth time he'd come in second in the nation. So he had four number two plates. And he says, what do I got to do to get a championship? I says, you have to actually double the amount of work you're doing now. It, it's just all work. And he, he did it. And I saw his effort. And it paid off. In 2018, he won the championship. Well, Ken, how have you had time? You're a successful trucking business owner, right? I mean, how have you had, had time to manage business and racing? Well, it's, it's a little bit of compromise. Because before I got back into it, I had the, the business up to four trucks. And things were growing very rapidly. And then I bought TJ Hoffmeister's old street bike and, and set a record with it. And I'm like, ooh, so this is fun again. And uh, then I, I hovered at three trucks for a long time. And then actually down to two, paired it, everything down to two trucks that I could get going in the morning, get them off, 
And when I signed with Honda, I would have everything out the door and running by nine o'clock in the morning. And then I'd be out in here until three o'clock in the afternoon. The trucks would come back in. I'd take care of them. Then uh, have dinner with the wife and kids and go play with them. Then I'd be back in the garage. So it is a lot of work. If you want to win a championship, if you just want to have a good time at the track, that's a good time too. But I, I, I always needed more. He doesn't know how to have fun at the racetrack. He has to know. How, the only thing he knows how to do is win. <laughs> and if he's not winning, he's not having fun. I'm joking. I, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been known to be very, very serious. Yeah. Well, hey, you, you approach it like a job, and that's why you have such a professional team. Andy Sawyer. Andy Sawyer from DME thought I was bitching out my son. I don't know if I can say bitching on this, but um, I'm, I'm looking at him, and I went like this. And... <laughs> And he thought I was like, look at me, you asshole. <laughs> and all this really meant was turn your headlight on. But I'm Aww. so intense. I'm in so intense in everything I do. He thought you were talking smack. He, he really thought uh. I was pissed. And, and I, I've i heard that from enough people. I didn't think I was that way, but I I accept the fact. You're just in, in the I'm mode. I'm a very serious Well, they, they probably did not know you well enough at the time because I know that's not your, you're, you're never been one to high step into the end zone. <laughs> you're not really a flashy guy, but you can be a very intense guy. So, yes. Man, that's, uh, that's awesome. Another moment I want to talk about, I want to get both your takes on. I was there, got to announce it. It was special. Got to interview you after. 10 years ago, you became the first turbo bike in the sixes, Valdosta, Georgia, and you did it with a Honda. I mean, what do you remember about how special that moment was? Um, actually, he was riding it, and I, I just saw the scoreboard come up, and I'm like, man, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because Ryan Schitz had done it uh, earlier. Nitrous bike, right. Maryland. But being a one-off, is a blessing and a curse. If you find something that works, you're the only one do that's doing it and you can outperform everybody. But then it gets very easy to have the rules changed. The rules change real easy when all it affects is one person. And we've had the rules changed against us many times. And I actually held back when we went to 704, that was shutting it off in, in six gear because I didn't want to go too fast and have them change the rules on us again. Turns out they changed it anyway. We should have just <laughs> held it open. It would have been a 697. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. I've always been one to look forward. Uh, I think DME is actually doing it right. Just whatever it'll take, blow the record out as far as you can. They're going to change the rules. Let them change the rules. DME race team at Red Walls out of Timberlake, North Carolina. 2006 Suzuki. And here comes Team Honda. One of the originators of Street Bike Shootout, Ken Stott. What's up, everybody? Jack Corpella here for DragBikeLive.com. History has been made at the Manufacturers Cup from South Georgia Motorsports Park. Coming into this event, there was only one six-second street bike in the world. Well, guess what? Now there's two, and one of them is a Honda. Congratulations to this gentleman right here, Frankie Stotts, 698 in round number two of Pro Street. Tell me about it. Uh, it's just an amazing run. We've been uh, trying to do this all year, but since we got limited on our fuel issue back in May, uh, we finally had an opportunity to come out here with a fuel that we can actually use and uh, came out here and started swinging our bat. How much does this mean to you? I know you guys have been after this achievement for a long, long time. To finally see that number come up on the scoreboard, 698, what's it mean to you? Uh, it's a huge accomplishment. Uh, I, I don't know. There's really no words to explain it, but uh, me and my dad have been working a lot, a lot for this, so it means a lot. And speaking of dad, the legend, the four-time champion, Ken Stotts, how much of your success do you owe to Kent? Uh, I owe pretty much everything. Watching him when I was a little kid and, and then having him teach me how to do what, what he does is just uh, unexplainable. Speaking of Dad, Kent Stotts, come here. Where's Dad at? Come here, Dad. We got to talk to you. One of, the, one, one of the forerunners of Street Bike Shootout. I know you've been out to the six-second pass for so long. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's been... 
uh, not a long time going, but it's here. I know a lot of people were surprised when you retired and you put your son Frankie on the bike. Boy, you must be a good coach because Frankie's turned into one of the best riders in the country. Well, I, I threw him to the dogs because in one weekend I asked him if he wanted to ride the bike. I was on my Blackbird and I needed somebody on the, the 1000. His fastest pass at the time was a 1006 on a bone stock 1000 Honda. And he got on my Pro Street bike and in four passes he went a 780. So I said, I think he's got what it takes. Well, he certainly did today. Congratulations. History made. Congratulations, Team Honda. Congratulations to Kent and Frankie Stotts, the second member of the Pro Street Six Second Club. Yeah! Frankie, talking about that, that first six-second run for a turbo bike, what did that mean to you? Is that one of your all-time career moments? Yeah, it was more like a, like a monkey off our back because we were trying so hard. I mean, we were on the pace to do it at the beginning of the year. I mean, the first race of the year, we went out there and set a new record at the 710 and then they outlawed the fuel on us. So it was pretty much, I don't know. Uh, bittersweet. 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 So. Well, let me, let me ask you this. I don't know if you guys got enough credit or acclaim from that record, but, but maybe you did. You tell me. Because I know I talked to Brock Davidson a lot, and he says that, look, running the first seven on a street tire, he's like, that laid the groundwork for my business, my fame, everything. That was amazing. He said, my company would not be here without that. For you to be the first turbo bike in the sixes, that's an equally impressive milestone. Do you, do you feel like you were able to get what you needed out of that in terms of recognition, sponsorship? Is I, that something that's helped? I think so. Keep Honda. Time, you know, now we're so far deep in the sixes, it's getting a little bit lost. But uh, I think people remember it, and and certainly Honda remembered it. They they were very thankful that we showed that uh, Honda can be first in many different ways. You know, not just road racing and, and motocross and their drag racing, their bikes are capable of drag racing, setting records and winning championships. When you meet with Honda in this day and age, are they concerned about performance and what you do? Or is it more about ROI and engagement and impressions and all that stuff? Or is it a combination? Uh, you know what it really is? It's about um, good relations. It's Honda wants to build a family of motorcyclists. They hope to win, they, they strive and they, they give us the equipment to win and they, they trust in us to do that. But it's really, my first boss at, at Honda, Charlie Keller, uh, said to me, first and foremost, we wanna promote goodwill and, and uh, friendship and family fun. And we found this in drag racing. So that was, that was fantastic. Um, some companies are all about the W and if you don't get it, you're gone. Maybe that's why I've been with them for 21 years. We've had five championships, so that, that helps. But uh, even in the lean years, they, they weren't pressuring me. That's awesome. Uh, Frankie, I hope you become the next Ken Roxon of motorcycle drag racing. Speaking of Ken, who's had a, a million surgeries, we, we thank God you're here because you had a real scare. How many years ago now? Uh, four years ago. Four years ago in a terrible car wreck. Tell me about it. Uh, just pretty much on my way home from my best friend's house and uh, went through intersection. Last thing I remember uh, was the light behind me turning yellow and then I remember just waking up in a hospital bed uh, saying that I got hit by a drunk driver head on. Thank God you're okay, man. Show me your show me your forearm if you can, if you don't mind. I know you still deal with, oh dear God. What are we looking at? Uh, pretty much is the scar from my accident. And this is my forearm muscle that pokes through uh, Pretty much everything there's a uh, there's muscles wrapped in a bed sheet which is pretty much it's called a fascia and they had to cut through it to get to my bone and when they did um it wasn't healed up right away so when i started working out for physical therapy it herniated through uh the fascia and now i can pretty much just pull like big you're <laughs> like, like a freak show big pop a pump yeah this, this is my this is my big pop a pump i love it <laughs> And honestly, we're, we're so happy you're, you're still here because we, we know stories like that where people, people unfortunately, are gone. Uh, how thankful are you to be alive after that experience? Uh, pretty thankful. It was a huge eye-opener or a huge, yeah, pretty much huge, huge eye-opener for me. Uh, being that close to being killed is uh, pretty traumatic. So he really, makes, he he really made, doubled his efforts then because he knew how close he'd come to winning championships and it was then during his recovery period, he says, that's when he said, Dad, what do we have to do to get a number one plate? 
And that's when he's really started buckling down to make it happen. And, and like I said, he made it happen in 2018. Well, that's a very similar story to Ken Rocks. And I got to ask you as concerned father, right? We talk about how, how ironic uh, a young man who's going six seconds, 200 miles an hour in a street tire motorcycle, and then almost loses his life in, in a car. Right. Uh, I mean, everybody well, thought he got hurt. Right. on. Oh, did he crash? No, he got hit by a drunk driver. At that point, as, as a concerned father, I mean, what, how terribly stressful was that for you to get through that to make sure he was okay? It, it, it was very stressful the first day, first 24 to, to 36 hours, but he kept repeating the same thing over and over. He'd say something to him, we'd give him an answer, and he'd ask the same question five minutes later. Oh. And that really scared us. And the doctor said, this isn't unusual, but if it continues for more than 48 hours, then he's had some brain trauma that may or may not be repairable. So luckily he came out of it and it's somewhere between 24 and 36 hours. And uh, well, his brain is probably still scrambled, but that, that was always that way. <laughs> well, Frankie, it's an amazing success story, what you've been able to do with your life. And number four on the GOAT list, yep. we, got, we got a chance to move up, you think? Uh, I think so. I, it won't be this year. Um, I started a new job back in March, and I just don't have a lot of wiggle room for time off. I've been there. I feel your pain, my brother. I've, I, drag racing has cost me a few jobs over the years. Yeah, so, so I feel um, you. Those, those bosses, they just don't understand about the... No, they The, the weekends are good, but the two days that it takes to get to the race and get back, that's usually a problem. Right. So. so I think we'll definitely be out there full-time next year. Okay. that would be great to see, guys. Yep. Well, this has been so awesome. We promised people we were going to hear this beast roar. Before we hear this beast roar, is there anything you would like to add or pass on? No, it's uh, it's been a fantastic career. I'm I'm hoping it continues. Um, I'd really like to get a hold of that new R R R and uh, see what we could what we could do with that. Oh, it would be cool. We'd love to see Honda. You and I were bench racing earlier today, and we said, look, 1999, 2000, Gainesville World Finals, nothing bigger or badder. I wish there was a Cycle Drag YouTube channel back then because we had Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki. They were all there. Suzuki was there. It was, it was amazing. It would, would certainly be nice to bring some factory involvement back on that level. Yes, and it would. Those were the days for sure. Yep. But you guys have held on. You have the world's fastest Honda. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we promised you, hopefully, we hope we're going to hear the world's quickest and fastest Honda. Well, it's a stone-cold motor, but we'll see what it does. It's cold here in Chicago. Yes, it is. <laughs> single moment of this oh my gosh these guys are awesome it smells delicious i hope you could smell through your computer your cell phone i'm gonna give you some come on guys that made my night this was worth the trip to the windy city of chicago i want to thank you so much Thanks i want to thank you so much anytime and before we go we got a real street build over here yeah What's this? this is a project that i'm gonna be starting over the winter that's gonna be frankie's all his own Wow. I'll build the motor. He's doing everything else. Uh, so good things coming, huh, guys? Yep. yep. A, lot of, a lot of good things are coming. Well, again, I appreciate it. Um, Kent, I'm going to ask you one final question that I love to ask all the legends I come in contact with. Frankie, you're probably too young to answer this, but you could answer it anyways. The best life advice you could pass on to anybody watching this. <laughs> Okay. Oh. <laughs> I don't blame you, Frankie. I'm not old enough to give it either. I'm, I, I couldn't tell you. Just, um, I guess the most important thing is family. Because I've had my family behind me my whole life. Starting with my mom and dad uh, when I was racing mini bikes and go-karts. And 
um, they always encouraged me. And then when my kids came along, uh, my wife didn't say, oh, you have to stop doing that. So it's uh, so many times I've seen so many people get stopped by family and I've had nothing but support from them. So family really is the key. Amen. Love it. Thank you guys so much. Best of luck. World's quickest and fastest Honda. Woohoo! 620 someday. What do you think? We'll see. It's coming. Hopefully. Leather collection. <laughs> it's mostly his. Awesome. I've got most three of, suits. Most in of his old ones are packed away up in. The and store. Frankie, you got three sets of leathers over here too, man. Yes, sir. What a collection. I love it. That's that's my kind of man cave right there. <laughs> Motorcycle Fanatics, thank you so much for watching. Please hit subscribe, like, leave us your feedback. We never want you to miss a video. In fact, speaking of videos, here's another video I want you to check out. You know if there's anything fast motorcycles, we're in. Cycle Drag rolls on.